it started. Um, it looks like we have a few on Zoom this morning. And uh, today, Pastor Larry has taken us to the final expectation. We're at the very end of the, the Gospel of John. And um, like we've talked about in some of the other uh, Sunday school lessons, I just find it fascinating because John, who is the, the gospel writer, often places himself in the story. And uh, obviously he was there anyway, but it's interesting how he does it. And he does it here in two different spots, which is kind of just humorous. At the same time, it does add a level of personal touch and credibility to the story and to the writings, which is very pronounced and important. Um, it's just fascinating to see how he does it in my view. Uh, so today uh, we're, we're at the end of the Gospel of John and we are at the, the end of what John writes about Jesus being with them. The other Gospels kind of give us, uh, in Matthew you have the Great Commission, you have very much uh, kind of the, the story after this. But in John's view, this was the story that he wanted to make sure that he ended with. And if you recall, uh, last week we were, um, we were really dealing with breakfast by the sea and we were dealing with the concept of Jesus had invited the disciples who were fishing to come onto the shore and, and to break bread with him and have fish. And they were gathered around the fire. And some of the critical points that Pastor Larry pointed out to us last week was that um, that Jesus, in essence, was offering around that fire forgiveness for Peter and kind of reinstating Peter, which is a good, important point that we all want to kind of remember in that concept. Um, we all have this thing that goes on with us where you know, when we, when we fall short of the expectations of God and we recognize that we fall short, sometimes we pull back. We, we pull back in our relationship with God. We, we have guilt. Um, and, and that guilt can be a good thing, but it can be something that we don't dwell on. It, it should be something that we don't focus on. Because when we are focusing on guilt, when we focus on shame, when we focus on on um, the wrongs that we have done, we're usually not giving ourselves the same level of grace that others would give us, let alone the grace that God would give us. So as we look at today's lesson, uh, and some of your Bibles are, the subtitle is uh, Jesus Challenges Peter, right? And that, that's a great concept, but I want you to realize why he's challenging Peter. He's challenging Peter to refocus and redirect him. And Pastor Larry has called the lesson the final expectation, and I think it's appropriate. So um, we're going to get into this in a moment, and uh, we'll follow our outlines. But before we do, I'm going to put the, the computer over in front of uh, Stacy so she can read, so the folks on Zoom can hear her. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Peter. Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. I love you. Jesus said, I feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them this disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus. What about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, <coughs> this is as for you, follow me. 
So the rumor spread among the community of the believers that this disciple would die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He said, only if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? This disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that the, his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Thank you, Stacy. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at her outline. Um, as you look at the outline, it's it's important that we kind of answer for ourselves. Why do you think Jesus asked the same basic question of Peter three times? So Kim Campbell says because he denied him three times. Remember uh, back in, in John 18 that Peter denied Jesus three different times. Uh, the night that, that Jesus was on trial just before he was crucified. Yep, and, and that's a good answer. Okay, so that has some concept, if you will, of the concept that Pastor Larry was talking about breakfast by the sea last week, that Jesus was kind of bringing Peter back. He was kind of reinstating Peter, if you will, into his role as the leader of the church. And that's good. So that, that makes sense. Any other reasons you can think of that he might have done that, Kathleen? Um, in John question and command is yes it absolutely is and we're going to get into that in a moment so thank you for bringing that up yep exactly right each question is a little different and each response that jesus gives to peter is a little different okay yeah pam says to let go of the past that's good yeah yeah you don't want to forget that jesus the way that Jesus works in his relationship is constantly bringing us back to where he wants us, not to push us back to where he doesn't want us. And I want you to think for a minute. Sometimes we do that in our human interactions and relationships. We will often, when we're trying to reconcile with people, we want to bring up the past. We want to remind them what they have done to us. We want to talk about the hurt you notice Jesus doesn't do that what's he doing instead he's pulling him forward he's not pushing him back he's pulling him forward and so perhaps if you seem um, maybe they're not the right word but if you seem a little stuck in your relationship with God is it because you're not listening to Jesus trying to pull you forward but rather you're expecting him to push you back and he doesn't do that that's not the way God works so if God doesn't work that way, then I might encourage you to remember that um, he doesn't want us to work that way. Now, let's keep moving. Uh, why is Jesus' use of Simon and not the name Peter that Jesus had given him kind of important here? Matthew 6, 18, or yeah, 16, 18 rather. Um, you know, you remember Jesus said, uh, Simon, you will now be called Peter which means the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not compel or fall against thee. Do you, do you remember that? So you see, he's using the name specifically to bring him back to where he wants him. So he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He's taking him back to where he used to be, bringing him forward again. Sometimes um, we do the same thing, right? <laughs> did, did one of your parents ever use your full legal name? Okay. Yeah. Is it is it Stephen Boyd? Boyd Stephen. Boyd Stephen. So how many times did you hear that growing up? <laughs> yeah and because uh, my three brothers we all had they always used the d in the name right david doug and dale when my mom would get really upset she would go through the list 
Okay. She wasn't sure who she was fussing at, but she was going to cover all of us. All right. And so we have a tendency to, um, a name means something to us. Okay. And so uh, it's important that you recognize that Jesus is bringing Simon to where he wants him to be. So sometimes God tells us he uses our full name. You know, he uses our full name sometimes when, when he's trying to talk to us. And we've got to get that. Now, he asked three questions. And at, on the surface, when you look at them, it says, do you love me more than these? And Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? And it looks like in the English translation that he's asking the same question three different times. And Kathleen's already touched on it. If you happen to have a um, New International Bible, Disciples Guide, Disciples Study Bible, it goes a little bit into the Greek translations of some of these questions and the way that Jesus is actually using them. And they're really important for the story to really hit to the center. All right. But I do want to, I do want you to grab this that Jesus uses simplicity in keeping the questions narrow. So Socratic teaching method, um, Socrates often used questions to answer questions. And sometimes that really bothers us when we, um, when we, when we think about others and we, we start to ask questions and they, they answer it with a question that upsets us, doesn't it? <laughs> so steve you use the socratic method of teaching you ask a question you answer a question with a question yes. she, does. she does why do you do that kim i want to be sure that i get the right okay okay all right well that's well, fair for okay Don't you understand? yeah clear? <laughs> <laughs> that's really not just that yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, Joe, it's Bob Ashley. Aren't you listening to me, boy? Um, yeah. So, so I want you to think that that um, it sounds so simple that Jesus asked the same basic question three times, but there's a depth to this. So sometimes when we are in a spot in our lives when Maybe our faith's in question. Maybe we're struggling with something. Maybe we're hurt in some way. Maybe we're in anguish or there's a division in our life. Um, we're looking sometimes for more complex answers when the answers can sometimes be simple. And, and God calls us to narrow it down sometimes. So using Katie and I as an example, all the, the, the issues that we've got in our lives right now, all the balls up in the air, if we try to, if we try to look at it its entirety, it's completely overwhelming. So we have to break it down a little bit at a time. So I encourage you in your life when you might feel there's a problem in your life or you feel um, a, a, a division in your life perhaps, don't overcomplicate the question. Don't overcomplicate the answer. Sometimes it is simple. Break it down. Break it down into its smallest proportion. In fact, in problem solving, many times when we teach problem solving, particularly when it deals with human interactions, we encourage people to get a view of the big picture, but then break it down into the small, smallest possible components and solve all those that you can. And usually if you get enough of those solved, the big problem is, is reduced to something that you can handle. But if you try to tackle the big problem all in its entirety at one time, it's too much. And um, Katie and I have been spent a lot of time in the emergency room the past few weeks uh, with various family members. And it's fascinating to watch those medical professionals work. You know, they, they know there's a big issue but they break it down into smallest components so they can deal with it, right? Because that's usually what a problem is. It's not one massive problem. It's a bunch of little problems and they contribute to something that's, that's larger. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, feed my lambs, all right? That's one response of Jesus. When he asked the question, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He says, Lord, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Sounds pretty similar. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He says, feed my sheep. Okay, so it sounds really like he's going back all the time but it's bigger. So we have often talked in this class about uh, agape love, right? So the Greeks, uh, their language is much more robust than the English language. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those languages where they have more words than we do in the English language. So uh, technically the Greeks have seven different words for love. We in the church talk about four of them. OK, and in this case, Jesus is talking in particular, apparently when this is translated from the Greek to English, it leaves out three important concepts. OK, so when Jesus is saying, feed my sheep, he's actually using a derivative of agape, which agape love is what kind of love? Unconditional. OK, it, it is an all encompassing love that says no matter what, I'm going to love you. OK, no matter how you act to me, what you do to me, what you say about me, um, how you look at me, I am still going to love you no matter what. Unconditional love. OK, I'm going to love you in spite of you being you. In spite of me wanting to put you in the back of the truck on a long trip, I'm going to love you anyway. Agape love, okay? The second time that he goes into this. So Jesus says to him the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Here he also is using a derivative of agape love. Okay, so we are saying that Jesus is saying, take care of my sheep even when they don't deserve it. Take care of my sheep even when they haven't earned it. Take care of my sheep even when they're bad sheep. Love my people no matter how they behave and how they act. All right? And then the third time, he says, feed my sheep. And then he goes into some explanation. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and leave you where you don't want to go. It's talking about his death. Okay, and tradition has it, by the way, that Peter didn't believe when he was crucified by the Romans that he should be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. So tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down. He, he said, I can't be crucified the way Jesus was. It, it appears that Josephus, the, the Roman uh, historian, Roman and Jewish historian, actually wrote that that's what happened to Peter. So we assume that is correct. All right. But on the third instance, when he's saying, feed my sheep, he uses phileo. Phileo is another Greek term for a, a type of love. So the ones we normally teach in our church are agape, unconditional, eros, uh, which is a root word of erotic. Unfortunately, eros doesn't always have erotic in it. It actually is kind of a love between a man and a woman. We, we usually say that, that married couples have eros type of love, uh, a certain kind of love that's different than other loves that you have. And then um, you have phileo. Phileo is, um, if you will, kind of a familial type of love, the, the love that you brotherly love, if you will. Um, it doesn't have to be only with your brother. We, we often say in the Christian church today, there's my brother, there's my sister, and they're not related to us other than through Christ, right? So, so kind of think of phileo that way. And then storge is the more common that is used. And that's more of a, uh, that's a Greek term for love. That's kind of, um, I just, I just love that, that guy, you know, I, I just love that family or I, I just love my church. And so it's just kind of a, 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 an empathetic type of love that we have for general things. So 
Today, though, it's important to recognize that on that third response, Jesus is talking about, in essence, are you my friend? Are you my friend? And when he says that to Peter, if you notice the third time Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And I know when you read that, it's still okay to read it without any interpretation of the Greek language because we're still getting some great lessons from it. When you dig deeper, you begin to see that Peter is being asked by Jesus, you know, do you unconditionally love the people that I'm calling you to serve? You got to feed them. You got to take care of them. And then you're going to take care of my sheep unconditionally with love when they don't deserve it. They haven't earned it. It, it, particularly when you start realizing that Jesus calls Peter to even love the Gentiles, which is a Jew. That's like, wow, you know, I, I, I've got to love those people. You got to be kidding me. They're, they're dirty, filthy people. Uh, they don't believe the right things. They don't, they haven't earned. They're not special. They're not called. They're not chosen people of God. So Peter has to be thinking about that. And then finally he says, look, you're my friend. If you're my friend, you're going to follow me because I've asked you to, because you love me. You love me like a brother, right? Now, what are the lessons that we can gather from all that, that I just shared with you and that Pastor Larry shared in his message? What are the kind of lessons that we can pull from that? Yes, ma'am. Um, can we adopt love? Um, which is also spiritual, the divine love. It does not presuppose the existence of a mutual identity or relationship. Say that last part one more time. It does not presuppose a mutual identity or relationship. Yep, that's fair. So, um, so if I see that as him saying that in the first time about me with his lamb. In Matthew 18, 6, he calls the disciples little ones, that he's referring specifically to the disciples, that when the disciples act like humans, you have to have this spiritual, this divine love for them. Mm -hmm. It's good. And, and in the second one, for those who are the sheep, the, the existing sheep, which predominantly at this point are Jews. So again, the, the agape, the, the, you have to be the, the igniting love toward them. That's good. And, and third, um, I, I do think that includes Gentiles because Peter's going to get hit in, in not too distant time with a whole bunch of Gentiles coming in from Paul. Right. So, um, and he gets his blanket with the food. So, right. um, so I do think that there are interpretations that say Jesus is trying to get him to, to express agape. But I think Peter is right off the bat saying, I do presuppose a relationship with you. That's the feeling of it. I do have this identity with you. We're on the same page. I identify with you. I'm following you. And he keeps responding with filio because I think he's saying, I'm there. I'm already there. I know I have to do this. So I, I think the lesson for us is, though he, I'm not certain in the moment Peter realized he was asking him three times, to reinstate because of the three denials. I think he was, it's that frustration when you keep saying the same thing back to the person and yeah. they're like not hearing you, you know. Um, but I think Peter's saying, I'm ready to lay down my life for them. That's what filial life is, love is, that I'm willing. You're my brother. I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to die for you, sheep. That's good. So we can learn, or there are others as well. There's plenty of other responses. Kim? I was going to say, really, technically, land, land and sheep are not quite the same. 
Lamb and sheep are not the same. That's right. That's right. Yep, absolutely. So so lambs are more immature. That's that's a good point. Good point. I, I hope that you recognize there are probably many lessons here. Um, there, there are people that have been in your lives probably who have asked you the same question over and over. And it can be very irritating. It can be painful as it was to Peter. But if you really listen to those people and they have some wisdom, they ask the same question over and over because they're making you think it through, aren't they? They're making you understand the situation. Writers often do that. Okay? Ken, you look like you're ready to say something. I'm just thinking of an Army drill instructor. <laughs> just thinking of an Army drill instructor? Ask the same question over and over? <laughs> I, I think sometimes they're just trying to wear me down. <laughs> you know, how many times are you going to ask me the same thing and expect a different response? Yeah, I, I, I do that quite often. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, Kim, it's kind of worn off in almost 40 years of marriage. It used to work. Now it just, I've got to find another technique, okay? So I want you to recognize, though, that when God calls us, sometimes it feels like, Lord, you've already shown me that. Lord, I've already been here. Why do I have to be here again? And maybe it's a perfect time for us to think. If you're praying for the same thing, you feel like God hasn't responded yet. Maybe he's given you a different answer. Maybe he's given you the same question so that you can see it again and, and maybe to process it differently. So perhaps I challenge you not to shake your fist at God and say, God, you know, I, I've asked you this question over and over and over and you're, you're not giving me any different answer. Maybe we turn that around and say, okay, God, what am I supposed to be learned from this that I haven't so far? And that may be, to some degree, metaphorically, the key that opens the door for your understanding. All right. Now, verses 21 and 23. Uh, let me read it to you quickly. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And he's really talking about John. OK, remember, John is substantial. Well, in those days, it'd be substantially younger than the rest of the disciples. OK, we're, we're assuming he's in his teens, maybe even mid teens, but, but he's in his teens probably. And so John is, John's kind of walking around, right? He's the boy. Probably most people, most of the other disciples kind of look after him, right? He's the young guy. And so Peter turns around and says, well, what about him? And then he goes on. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Right? So what is Jesus telling Peter? Worry about, yourself, not him. Worry about yourself, not him, Pam says. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. What had he, been, what had he been, just been saying to Peter? What had Jesus been just been saying to Peter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, stay focused. In fact, I wrote two things down for you, and there's probably others. What's Jesus telling Peter? In essence, Peter says, well, what about this guy? Peter? Yeah, Peter, stay focused. I'm calling you. I'm giving your expectations to you. I want you to see clearly what your mission is. Stay focused. And then the other way to, to look at that is, and it somewhat sounds like stay focused, but slightly different. Remember this. We have to concentrate on what God calls us to do. We have to concentrate on what God calls us to do. Now, that does sound like stay focused. But it also means that I, I can't be sometimes too involved or too distracted by everybody else's activities until I know what mine's supposed to be. So all of us in this room, I believe, drive. And it's the same way there. Um, 
and I told you all years ago, I was in a defensive driving course uh, from some professional drivers. And, and, and the guy said it this way. He said, have you ever heard the term? He asked the group, have you ever heard the term stay in your lane? Of course, we've all, right, we've all heard that. He said, there's more to that than you think. When you're driving, particularly in a race car situation, he said, the problem with some drivers are they're looking at all the other drivers and they're not paying attention to their lane. And that's what causes the accident. So you stay in your lane, you stay focused. Your eyes stay on lane. Now, you're aware of what others are doing, but you're focused on your lane, all right? So it's great for Jesus to tell Peter, and he doesn't use these words, but Peter, stay focused. I want you to concentrate on what I have called you to do. Don't worry about little John, okay? I'll take care of him. Now, if Peter had been called, I want you to mentor John all by yourself and that's your focus, that's a different conversation, isn't it? Okay? All right. Look at the next question. How does that fit your faith? Someone says to you, do you know what your mission is? Do you know what your call is? Are you staying focused on that? Are you able to concentrate on that? That's a question you have to answer. I can't answer it for you. And then look what else I put. Why do you think we compare ourselves with others? Human nature is the easy answer. I'm not going to give you that one. What, what else is it? Carter? Because we look up to them. We, it could be because we look up to them. Good point. I'm Ken? Ken Marshall? What an honest answer that is. Ken Marshall answered, Ken Marshall answered for those on Zoom, I'm looking for the lowest common denominator so I don't have to work so hard. That's, that's an honest answer. I appreciate that. Why else do we compare ourselves to others? Yeah, sometimes it makes us feel better, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not so bad. Look at how bad that person is. Okay. Lord, I'm not such a sinner. I just saw on TV. This guy's a lot bigger sinner than me, right? So yes, it does make us feel a little better. It uh, it ameliorates some of our concerns about that. Well, don't we learn that at home, like, you know, mother comes in and says, okay, he did it. Well, I wasn't as bad as he was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He did it more yeah. than I did. Yeah. And, and you blame him off me. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. In fact, we often, Laura's right, we often say that, um, you know, it's degrees of sin. That's where we get this concept. You know, Lord, I'm a little sinner compared to that person who's a bigger sinner, right? And, and we forget that for God, he's interested in us being connected to him. And when we sin, we separate. And you're right. In some cases, it's a little separation. In other cases, it's huge separation. But separation is separation. If, if your phone line goes dead on me, whether it's a little dead or all dead, I still can't communicate with you, right? And so we have to appreciate that, all right? The other thing is humans are naturally competitive. Uh, you'll, you'll find that some people say, I'm not really competitive. Yeah, they are in something. I don't know what it is. It might be how many books have you read or, um, you know, ha have you been to this place? Oh, yes. I, you know, we, we are competitive. We just, we just are. Now, the next question I want to ask you, though, is an important one. What do you think you'll be known for? Uh, as you think about what might your obituary say, um, that's one way some people suppose to, to put that down. I, I instead would say, what do you think people think of you when you walk away? Not that you need to be consumed by that, not that you need to lose sleep over that, but sometimes it's appropriate to ask the question, what do you think you'll be known for? That can help you tune and adjust a little bit. Don't get consumed by it. Don't let it interfere with your daily life, but think about it once in a while. And then finally, I ask this. Do you see God's plan for you as a blank? How would you answer that? Do you see God's plan for you as blank? How would you answer that?
Do you see God's plan for you as a blank? And no, I'm not moving on until some of you answer. A shepherd. What is it? A shepherd. A shepherd of Satan. So do you see God's plan for you as a shepherd? Okay. What else? A blessing. Okay, that's good. Do you see God's plan for you as a blessing? As a follower, do you see God's plan for you as a or as so? Let's go back to the kind of loves that we talked about the Greek loves in the three questions. So Jesus was expressing, Peter, do you have agape love for the people that I'm calling you to? unconditional love and then at the last one he's kind of saying phileo in other words do you have the the the, the friendly familial love that i want the brotherly love that i want you to have for those people for what i've called you to do so do you see god's plan for you as a good way to answer that is best do you see God's plan for you as best. And if you see God's plan for you as best, then God's expectation is that you'll give him your best. You with me? If God's plan for you is best, then we are called to give him our best. We are called to surrender to his best. Mm -hmm. Okay, to surrender to his best. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. All right, verse 24, quickly. This is the disciple who testifies these things and, and who wrote them to, down. We know that his testimony is true. So the question for you might be from this, what will you testify to? You see, John is testifying to what he's witnessed, what he's experienced, what he's seen, what he's heard. That's what our call is. So no, you didn't camp out for Jesus or with Jesus for three years. And, and no, you didn't. You weren't sitting at the Last Supper with him. But God has been in your life at different times. What will you testify to? All right. And then I ask this question on your outline. What will be your story about God's influence on your life? You see, there's a lot of people who are intimidated by the Bible, who are misunderstanding the Bible, who are, in, and I, I don't mean this in an ingracious way, who are ignorant of the Bible, whatever it might be. But you may be the only Bible they ever see. So how will you testify about God in your life? That's what they want to know. They know you. In many cases, they have relationship with you. They trust you. So this guy, John, who writes in the Bible, that's fine. But they want to know about Kim or Josh or Laura, you know, or Joe, whoever it might be. They, they want to know about you because they have a relationship with you. So what will your story about God's influence in your life be? And then verse 25. Jesus did many other things well, if every one of them as well. Uh, if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So I think it's fascinating. Why is John's point one we must remember? And because we're running out of time, I'll give you some of those answers. We only have some of the awesomeness of Jesus recorded. So we only have some of it. I mean, John's saying right here, there were three years of really awesome, great things that were happening. We only wrote a few of them down. Okay. Um, you have had experiences like that in your life. Um, Joe, remember when we had a busload of people that went to, uh, to, to New River Valley and we went, uh, you know, we went rafting. Um, so if we sat down and I was telling you about that, I'd tell you a few stories, right? But I wouldn't be able to tell you about the whole experience for two days. Okay. I wouldn't, it's just not human nature. I would tell you a couple of really cool things that happened, but I wouldn't tell you about two days worth. 
So the Gospels and the Bible don't tell us everything that happened with Jesus. It gives us, if you will, the things that are important, but not all of the things. And so here's the point. And here's a point I want you to recognize about your relationship with God. And I wrote it this way. There is more. There is more. And so today, as we wrap up the lesson on the final expectation, I, I really want you to recognize that what I believe Pastor Larry, part of what he said is, and part of what I want to say, and I think part of what God wants to say to us today is, there is more. There is more in the relationship with God that we're not reaching. There is more in the relationship with each other that we're not reaching. There is more in the Bible that we're not reaching. You with me? So even though we get some, we don't get it all, but there is more. And so when you recognize that God is good, I want you to recognize that there is more goodness to God than what you're aware of. Tap into that. So look at the last question. What would Jesus want you to hear if he was only available to you one last time? What would Jesus want you to hear if he was only available, available to you one last time? And as you look at this, we're rapidly approaching the last time that he's with Peter. And look at some of the things he wanted him to hear. So if you only had one prayer left and you were talking to Jesus, what do you think he would want you to hear for the last time? I think there's some commonality in that with all of us, but there may not be. Dwell on that this week and recognize, as Pastor Larry has challenged us, that Jesus has some expectations of Peter and he has expectations of us. Remember, there is more. There is more than we understand and know here. There's an awesomeness to God that we have only just tipped We've only touched the little tip of it. And be aware that, that God is calling all of us to recognize that uh, he has special love for us. And he wants us to have special love for his people. And that may be our mission all by itself. Let's send a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've called us out today. That you, as you did with Peter, you have an expectation that we use love in feeding and taking care of your people, that, that we look out for those people, that we're willing to lay down our life for them, that we're willing to give time and energy, our time, talents, and treasure to do what you called us to do. And whatever that might be for each of us, Lord, help us to make it more evident and help us to recognize with you there is always more. There is more goodness, more blessings, more grace, more love, more forgiveness. And for that, we're eternally grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget PSA announcement. Um, May the 9th, we go to uh, 8, 8 a.m. worship service, 10 a.m. worship service, 9 o'clock Sunday school. Okay? 8, 9, and 10. So we'll welcome you here. And blessings to you this week. Take care.